Okay, so before someone gives me shit in the comment section, yes, I know that Borderlands isn't technically the first looter shooter, as a game called Hell's Gate London takes the title by two years. But listen, man, barely anybody played that shit at launch, and I also need a snazzy secondary title for this video, so uh, deal with it. Anyway, Borderlands, Gearbox's unexpected success released back in 2009. Third game's on the way, so might as well take a trip down memory lane and see if the original is still worth a damn. Inspired by the likes of Halo, Diablo, Duke Nukem, and a buttload of other games, Borderlands stuck out like a sore thumb back in 2009, and not just because of its cell shaded graphics, although that's a big part of it, but also because of its wacky characters and its strangely addicting gameplay loop of shooting and looting. It's kind of crazy that it took until 2009 for a developer to be like, let's take the shooty shooty bang bangy stuff from Halo and combine it with Diablo's RPG stuff. The appeal is really that simple, which doesn't sound like much nowadays, especially considering how many games run with the same formula. But you have to remember back in 2009, military shooters ran shit. It was all about fast paced multiplayer death matches. So a game like this, while not exactly a breath of fresh air, was still a needed diversion. Does it still work as such a decade later? Well, let's get into it. And yeah, I'm checking out the original version. I'll share my thoughts on the enhanced version later in the video. So Borderlands takes place on the wasteland planet of Pandora, a place full of unhinged bandits, bloodthirsty wildlife, and a bunch of other shit that would frighten your average person. A group of four people called the Vault Hunters arrive on the planet to find the vault. What is the vault? Well, all we know about it early game is that it's some mythical alien vault located somewhere on the planet that holds something special. In the beginning of the game, you have to choose who you're going to play as between these vault hunters. You got Roland the Soldier, who specializes in rifles, shotguns, and throws out this automatic turret. Mordecai the Hunter, who specializes in snipers, pistols, and can send out his bird to attack people. Brick the Berserker, who specializes in anything explosive, and sometimes abandons his guns to throw hands. And lastly, Lilith the Siren who specializes in anything elemental and can basically dimension hop. Yeah, I'm boring, I chose the soldier, but you can't blame me man, this turn is just too damn practical. Also, it doesn't really matter all that much since every character can use every weapon in the game, so it's not like you're completely locked into one playstyle. Anyway, after choosing your character, you're telepathically greeted by some anonymous woman who goes by Guardian Angel, who wastes no time giving you instructions. The first of which is meeting the mascot of the series, Claptrap. Claptrap guides you to Firestone, the first hub town of the game, and it's here where you meet up with Dr. Zed. It's also here where your vault hunting adventures truly start as you meet a bunch of different NPCs throughout the game that give you quests dealing in slaying bandits, skags, and retrieving shit that they're too lazy to get themselves. Man, I remember seeing advertisements of this game back in the day. I was not fucking with the look of this game at all. I don't know, something about the cell shaded graphics for a first person shooter didn't jive well with me. But that was back then. These days, I actually like it when games go for a more stylized approach in how they look. And the look of Borderlands has definitely warmed up on me. It stands out visually from a lot of other shooters till this day. The choice to make the game cell shaded was definitely a good idea as it's aged a lot more gracefully than a lot of other games from that era. The only two knocks I can give it is that the anti-aliasing isn't the best and personally, I'm not fond of Pandora as a setting. Which I know you're not supposed to be as it's a barren planet full of ghost towns and rotting caves, but still, they could have added some more colors outside of gray and brown. I swear, if these areas weren't named, I would think they were all the same place. There's also the character's lip flaps not matching the voice acting, but that's being a little nitpicky. Alright, I got my character and some guns, let's find this damn vault. So even though we refer to games like this as looter shooters these days, that wasn't the case back in 2009. Gearbox referred to this game as a role playing shooter. You know, pretty much a shooter with some RPG elements. It doesn't really matter what the hell you call it though, since both the genre tags accurately describe what you're doing for 90% of the game. Except a crap ton of quests from some NPCs you don't care about, shoot down some baddies, get a weapon with better stats, rinse and repeat. 
Those that have played games like Destiny, Warframe, or The Division already know the deal. Shit, if you played any Western RPG, you already know the deal too, since a lot of the missions are stuff like go collect a certain number of rocks or kill a set amount of enemies that are causing trouble. The shooting in Borderlands generally feels pretty good, as every weapon has a nice kick to it when you're firing, but that's a little later on because the combat in the beginning is uh, pretty dry. I mean, this is the reloading speed for almost every gun in the beginning. It eventually gets better though as the more you use a certain type of gun, the more proficient you become with it and then later on, it's like you have the fucking sleight of hand perk from Call of Duty activated. When you get headshots, guys' heads explode and shit. Explosions causes some limbs to fly off. It's pretty damn gnarly. <laughs> but these bandit guys do this to their victims, so uh, I don't feel bad. Plus these bandit guys are goofy as hell. While the shooting is good, it's not really the thing that gets you hooked though. It's more the looting enemies and leveling up stuff. The reason this is is because of the crap ton of randomly generated weapons in this game. Whether it be from enemies, chests, or vendors, this game spoon feeds you new guns like a motherfucker. I swear you spend just as much time equipping and dropping new weapons as you do shooting bandits. Don't get too attached to any new guns you find in this game because you're going to be ditching it real soon for another gun with more green arrows. I'm making this sound like a negative, but it's actually one of the things that kept me going through this game despite some of the bland missions. The constant positive feedback loop of getting new guns from enemies you take out definitely works. It also helps that a lot of these guns vary in design. The loot system in this game also uses the same color-coded scale that you find in a lot of Blizzard games, which makes things easy to understand. For those that don't know, it's pretty simple. White font means it's boring and sucky. Green font means that it's better than nothing. Blue font means that it's good shit. Purple font means that it's great shit. And orange font means holy shit, I can't believe I found this. The more guys you kill, the more you level up. The more you level up, the more skill points you acquire. The more skill points you acquire, the more you can put into the skill tree, which makes you into a one-man militia. Typical RPG power trip stuff, but you're gonna need it in this game with these guys. Not that the enemies in this game are hard. This is just one of those games where if the enemies you're dealing with are just like two levels higher than you, then your ass might be Swiss cheese. Especially if you're fighting these badass variants of enemies where they do more damage and have more health. A lot of the enemies in this game could be pretty damage spongy, which is pretty annoying at times, but luckily the Vault Hunter gang get plenty of tools along the way to make things easier. Being a looter shooter, of course there's a crap ton of guns that drop from enemies, but aside from the usual categories of shotgun, assault rifle, there's also a high chance that an elemental weapon will be dropped. The four elements in this game are fire, shock, explosive, and corrosive. Fire weapons merc enemies with no shields, shock weapons merc enemies with shields, explosive weapons speak for itself, and corrosive, well, kind of mercs everything. Seriously, armored enemies wouldn't be introduced into the second game, so corrosive is just kind of here and isn't really balanced along with the other elements. I mentioned earlier in this video that this game was inspired by Halo. Well, check out the sound of your shield when it's broken. It doesn't take long for the world of Pandora to open up to the player, especially if you reach the second area of the game and you're using the catch a ride a lot more often. Suddenly the game goes from western Halo to motherfucking Mad Max. I don't mind too much since the driving of this game actually isn't too shabby. You also gotta like how the slightest bump of your vehicle causes things to explode. You bastard. The backtracking does get kind of monotonous though, especially since the world of Borderlands is fragmented into different areas. This means a lot of damn loading screens. 
I don't even give a damn about interconnected worlds as much as I used to, but this game definitely would have benefited from having one. There's also a lot of huge ass areas in this game that are barely used. Like you're sent to a big area once to kill some guy, and then you like never return. Or you like return once. I don't know, a lot of the areas in this game just feel really spacious for no real reason, but maybe that's just me. Well, at least these areas are accompanied by some pretty good music, more specifically the calmer themes that play when there's no combat. At least in the beginning of the game, there's this soothing trip-hop western sounding theme that sounds pretty dope. What's also dope is that with each new area, the music becomes a lot more darker and menacing, matching the increasingly hostile environments. The later tunes are pretty dope too. Speaking of the latter parts of this game, god damn were these Crimson Lance guys a pain in the ass. I swear when it comes to the badass versions of these guys, it's almost impossible to not take damage when in a gunfight. Oh and don't even get me started on these Guardian guys, I swear even with these shock weapons, these dudes will have their way with you. Thank lord for second win in this game because without it, this game would be a lot harder. For those that don't know, second win is simply another chance at life when you're on the brink of death. Kill an enemy while you're in this state and voila, you're back in the game. It's literally a lifesaver and a good way for the flow of combat to not be interrupted. But sometimes shit like this can happen where you go down and there's no enemies to get a second wind off of. This is why it's always good to bring a buddy along with you. Yep, Borderlands is a co-op game. Getting three other people to partake in this adventure is definitely the way to go. I mean, being that it's co-op, it's almost by definition a good time since you're playing with friends. But the other benefit is that there's other players that the CPU can shoot at instead of you. You can imagine that this makes things a little bit easier. But only a little since with each new player in your world, the more health and attack power enemies have. Yeah, Gearbox wasn't just gonna let you completely steamroll through this game with your squad. Either way, it's still a good time nonetheless. Ironically, most of the normal enemies will give you more trouble than the bosses. Most of the bosses in this game are complete pushovers even when you go solo. For example, this is Sledge. He's hyped up several hours prior to his fight as being this dangerous bandit leader. This is how the encounter with him went. Luckily not all the bosses are this pathetic, but uh, they're definitely no show stealers. Most of them are just more damaged, spongy, normal enemies. There was also this guy where you had to fight your way up a canyon while avoiding gunfire, which was pretty different. But then again, he sends these badass bruiser guys at you, which can take way too much punishment. Speaking of which, did anybody else's game glitch out while attempting this survival side mission? Anyway, seeing as we're towards the end of this video, let's talk about the enhanced version released earlier this year. So the remaster introduces a bunch of quality of life changes from the later games. The user interface, the minimap instead of this damn compass, 4K resolution, and apparently more guns and customization. And a harder final boss, which... I didn't get to since I just stuck with the original. With all these improvements, you're probably wondering why. Well, at least on PC, the enhanced version is fucking broken. At least when it comes with its performance. There's this notorious glitch on this version where even if your game is set to a higher frame rate, it refuses to go past 30 frames. 
Want to play with friends or strangers? Well, I hope you like your game crashing. And that's not even mentioning all the crap ton of other issues that people have. Frankly, the enhanced version is not even that enhanced looking anyway. For the most part, they just upped the brightness. If you tinker in the settings of the original version, you can easily get it looking enhanced also. But I'd even do that since the lighting in the original version turns out to be a lot more dynamic. Also, what's with the choice to make the Guardian Angels animation into this digital shit rather than the FMV? Yeah, all this shit is pretty lazy, but I can't scold it too much since it comes free with the purchase of the original, DLCs included. And yes, I know about Gearbox's shitty spyware and sending the FBI to people's houses and shit, but this is a review of the company's game, not their behavior. Speaking of which, it's a bad time to get back to the story. So later on in your adventuring, you meet the snarky archaeologist woman named Patricia Tannis, who's also in search of the vault and wastes no time using your ass to find the other two pieces. When in search of the fourth piece, you're informed by Commander Steele of the Crimson Lance that there is no fourth piece and that Tannis betrayed you because of fucking course. She also disables any connection between the outside world and Pandora, which means bye bye to the guardian angel for the time being. You later run into Tannis inside the Crimson Lance Fort, where she explains that she was forced to betray you, and that Commander Steel and the Crimson Lance are closing in on the vault, and you have to reach it before they do. You do reach them before they open the vault, but then this happens. Go inside. <laughs> This is the Destroyer, the final boss of the game. But don't let the scary name fool you because this monstrosity is the pushover of pushovers. You can literally stand in this one spot and unload in its vagina for the whole fight. Once in a while it throws out its tentacles, but one shot brings that shit down quickly. So much for the universal threat. After that's done, the vault is sealed for another 200 years, Tannis gets what she wants, Guardian Angel is revealed to be Hyperion, and Claptrap starts a communist revolution. No, I'm not kidding about that last part. As for the story of this game, I can't say that I was really invested in anything that was going on, and that's mostly due to how the game presents the story. Most of the story in this game is told through these quest text boxes, which are wholly uninteresting. Most of the NPCs don't even have voice lines, and all of them aside from the main characters are similar looking mass dudes. You really just kind of go through the motions in this game, and doing what the other characters tell you just because. However, I do like that this game doesn't take itself too seriously. A lot of the main cast are almost as unhinged as the bandits that you're fighting, and have some memorable quotables up their sleeves as well. There's also a lot of slapstick too, especially with the bandits and the claptraps. Speaking of the latter, I'm still not sure if claptrap is annoying or funny. I guess it really depends on if this amuses you. Alright, so you found the vault and the game's beaten. Now what? Well, you can either go back and finish any side missions that you didn't finish, or you could go do the DLC that expands the world in the aftermath of the vault discovery. The zombie island of Dr. Ned, Mad Moxie's Underdome Riot, the secret armory of General Knox, and Claptrap's Robot Revolution. Four DLCs, a shitload of new areas with 30 hours of more content. Content that I didn't really care to explore if I'm going to be honest with you. I got fairly deep into each DLC and the gameplay loop of the base game doesn't really change very much with these extra areas. I mean in Jacob's Cove you're fighting zombies which is pretty dope, and Mad Moxie's Underdome seems like it would be a good time with some buddies as it's like one massive horde mode, but other than that it's really just more content for those that enjoyed the base game. Which I'm one of those people, however I got my fill of Borderlands gameplay loop with just the base game. Yeah yeah, I know you get crazy strong with a bunch of ridiculous over the top weapons later on, but I'm good with where I'm at. So yeah, that's Borderlands. The almost first looter shooter, and the first Gearbox game general audiences gave a shit about. Still pretty good if I do say so myself. Would much rather play the sequels, but what they started with here ain't too shabby. 
The combat's good, the world is realized, the graphics are still up to par. Don't know if I would recommend this to someone who isn't already into this style of gameplay, but for those that are, giving this a spin definitely won't hurt. Anyway, that's all I gotta say about this, so until next time.